I have what the idea I, ha I call the three D's that would be at the heart of judicial reforms. The three D's. And the first D is the decongestion of the Supreme Court. The second one would be the decongestion of the prisons. And the third one will be the decongestion of cost lists in courts across the country. And that is, cost, of course, uh, linked directly to speedy trials. Now, as to the decongestion of the Supreme Court, I would not occupy the office of AGA for four years without unbundling the Supreme Court. That would be my first task, to unbundle the Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court is the busiest Supreme Court in the world. And it's just not acceptable. The kinds of cases that go up to our Supreme Court are scandalous. Interlocutory appeals. Appeals dealing with, you know, frivolous matters. And I think this country is big enough now to have six regional Supreme Courts where appeals coming from those regions would end there in land matters, contract matters, marriage, and all of that. I mean, as the Supreme Court is designed today, you won't believe, distinguished senators, that a, a, a case of assault, I slap you, you slap me, will go up to the Supreme Court and be lining up with constitutional matters and political matters to be heard. That is scandalous. And that is why today, the Cases at the Supreme Court are pending there for the last 15 to 10 to 15 years. Justice delayed is justice denied. The diary of the Supreme Court I speak with you now is filled up to 2022. You cannot get a date at the Supreme Court now till 2022. Yes, now, except political cases. And the political cases are compounding the issues again. So, I don't know why it has not been possible to simply establish regional Supreme Courts. And so the Supreme Court in Abuja would only, would only entertain constitutional matters, political matters, and election disputes. Matters that have to do with, that have to do with the interpretation of the Constitution because at that point you need the Central Supreme Court to guide the entire Supreme Court across the country. And even at that point, in matters of constitutional interpretation, distinguished senators, it is scandalous also for a Supreme Court that has 21 justices, for seven of them to sit, to bind others, because the Supreme Court, by the principles of stereo decisis, is bound by its own decisions. So if you have a constitutional matter going to the Supreme Court now, seven justices sit, four can overrule three. So you have four justices giving their opinion on a very serious matter, binding 17 others who have, who have no, no opportunity to contribute to that judgment. And tomorrow, if those 17 others come, or part of those 17 others, and they want to determine that same matter, they will be bound by that decision, even if they have a separate view about it. It's scandalous. So there's something wrong about that system. In constitutional matters, I would press for constitutional amendment to make all the 21 justice seats because that's our ground norm. The concern is our ground norm. So four people cannot determine our ground norm. Where 21 are there. And then we're all bound by that. These are things that are wrong with our Supreme Court. So I will, I will, I will make a holistic unbundling of the Supreme Court and complete restructuring of the Supreme Court. Again, they have very scandalous applications. You see, there are, there are things we borrowed from Britain that are still bogging us down in terms of delay of cases. For example, the provision in the Constitution of leave to appeal. It is there in the Constitution that you must seek leave to appeal in certain matters. Over time, leave has been granted as a matter of course. But for you, before you appeal, a matter where you have, you have judgment against you, instead of you just having the right to appeal directly, you will first file a motion for leave to appeal. That motion for leave to appeal is pending for five years. For you to just seek a permission to appeal, I mean, why? Why do we still allow these antiquarian laws in our constitution? And these are things borrowed from Britain. It's only in exceptional cases they deny you leave to appeal now. Remove all provisions regarding leave to appeal. Let everybody have a right to appeal. 
Except, of course, the time to appeal. You can seek for extension of time. There should be time limit. But leave to appeal is antiquarian. Remove it from the constitution. Everybody should appeal as a matter of right. And so you can unbond the Supreme Court with all of this. The congestion of prisons, which is the second day, is that we are not complying with provisions of the law. I want to pay tribute to the Seventh Assembly that passed the Admission of Criminal Justice Act. If you look at the provisions of the Admission of Criminal Justice Act, provisions have been made there, adequate provisions, to address the congestions of our cells and our prisons. For instance, every police station in every part of this country should open its cell to the nearest magistrate court at regular intervals for the magistrate to just come and say, open your cell, I want to see who are those you are detaining here and why you are detaining them. The provision is there. The DPOs are supposed to make returns to the magistrates. So say, look, we have arrested this person, we are detaining them for this reason, and all and all. They are not complying with those provisions right now. Nobody's complying with those provisions. There are adequate provisions there. But the Administration of Criminal Justice Act is only applicable to federal courts because it's the National Assembly that passed it. Federal courts in Abuja and all of that. Now, it's only a few states that have adopted the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. I think Kogi and some other states. One or two other states. Now, for states that have not adopted the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, the scandalous situation we see now is that a person is arrested on a frivolous charge you know, arraigned in court on a supposedly capital offense. Once, once the magistrate court sees murder, armed robbery, even without a proof of evidence attached, they just say remand. We must amend the law and encourage state, government, go, go, state governments across the country to amend their criminal procedure acts or codes to ensure that at the point the magistrate is entertaining the charge against those accused persons, instead of sending them to remand, the magistrate should have powers to call for proof of evidence at that stage. Don't tell me that you want to take the file to DPP for advice. I want to see whether you have proof of evidence. If you don't have proof of evidence, even if I see murder, I will release him on bail. If I don't see any proof of evidence attached. Because, with apologies to the police, you, they arrest people on the road. And because you don't have 5,000 for bail, the next day they just type armed robbery and, and take you to court and remand. And the person starts a journey of six years in the prison without bail. That file will be sent to DPP maybe two years later. The person is still waiting. The DPP gets the file, the DPP keeps the file for another four years. It's not attending to the file. Because of our corrupt system. If you've got a corrupt DPP, unless you come and unless the person has a person, somebody or people to come and push that file. That file will never leave there for him to give us advice when there is no charge, no evidence against that person. And so our prisons are full of these awaiting advice people. They are full. How can we avoid this? Let us give the magistrates power to grant bail in respect of capital, so-called capital offenses if there is no proof of evidence at that stage. And then, even they are, that, that, course, that is all, of course links to the question that my, my very good friend Dino Malai asked about the powers of the DPP and the Attorney General that are subject to, can be subject to abuse. I think it is high time we amend the law to make the advice of the Attorney General and DPP subject to judicial review. It's high time. The, the Attorney General and the DPP cannot sit down in their office and exercise the judicial function and say you have no case to answer. The, the, the powers were put there to protect, of course, people who will be charged you know, with frivolous offenses. That's why they put the power there, so that the DPP can say, don't face trial because it will be frivolous. But on the other hand, it is subject to abuse where people who are actually guilty are freed by the DPP by advice. So we should, and to answer Dino Melaya's question, Senator, uh, Distinguished Senator Dino Melaya, that's section 174. Without indicting my very good friend Malabi, because I know he's a gentleman, he wouldn't withdraw any charge if he did not see the fact that there is no offense there. And I, I, I can vouch for him. If there's any case like that, Malami must have seen that there was no case. I can vouch for Malami in my sleep. He's a, he's a distinguished colleague. But there are other attorneys general across the states who we don't know who can exercise and abuse this power. And so, if the DPP gives an advice and says, we have you, there's no case against you, let gentlemen, distinguished senators, let us amend the constitution to make that power subject to judicial review. So that the people who are aggrieved 
can go to court with that advice and call for the proof of evidence. And the magistrate will say, the attorney general, you are wrong because this case, as I'm saying, there's prima facie case against these people. Charge them to court. We cannot give the attorney generals the power of the judiciary to perform the functions of the judiciary. But let me say that the conditions in section 174 right now, the other scandalous provision there, you put conditions there, but you make them subjective. So, Senator Dima is correct to the point that these conditions are put there. But do you, the Supreme Court has ruled in several cases that you cannot question the discretion of the Attorney General. So, the Attorney General says, I have looked at it, and those three conditions have been met. The Supreme Court says, well, it is his discretion. They will not even question that discretion. It is wrong. It's wrong. So, our concern is replete with mistakes antiquarian provisions that we must amend. Um, Chief uh, Kiamu, please I respond to all the questions they raised yes, and then we call on Senator James Manager to make his uh, comments or ask his questions finally. Just quickly, so I don't exhaust all the time. As to the restriction of political parties in the country, my, my humble view is that we must strike a balance between opening up the political space, which, we must, which a democracy allows. We must open up the, the political space to everybody strike a balance between that and of course ensuring that frivolous parties do not put frivolous parties do not put pressure on the public purse. I, I was the coalition agent for Mr. President at the last election and by the time they gave us the results sheet this was like a big wrapper like the 74 parties 74 candidates some of them did not even have up to 1,000 votes some of them had no votes at all in both parts of the country so how do we allow, and then INEC has to now print ballot papers to accommodate them, the ballot paper, and then that's pressure on the public purse. How do we address this? Distinguished senators, I think we can strike a balance by saying for new parties to be registered, you must show capacity at some small level first before you now come and contest for presidency. Register political parties, fine, but you cannot run for president or senate until you go and run for local government election first. Until you win a, a, a councillorship seat, you can reduce it to even one councillorship seat. Until you win a councillorship seat, you cannot run for governorship. Until you win one governorship, you cannot run for senate. And on and on like that. And so you graduate. They, they, they show capacity to begin to graduate. They show capacity at that level. We can strike a balance by passing this kind of laws to ensure that we all participate in the political process, but we also do not allow all kinds of people to put pressure on the public purse. Now, the questions are so many. Um, distinguished Senator Okpemi Bamidele, my senior in the struggle, my leader and street senior, my leader, political leader and leader in the struggle also, asked the question as why, how we, I how we handle activism and governance. I think people don't realize that governance is activism. It's just that because over the years, people have seen politicians as corrupt, as inept, and all that. It's wrong. We have distinguished senators here who are fighting for the rights of their people. They cannot fight for the rights of their people without being here. And I said before that, there's only so much you can do as a private person. Being here, distinguished senators, you know what you are doing. You are fighting for consumer protection. You are passing laws on consumer protection. You are passing laws regarding the rights of the people and how to give them support. That is activism. Activism is not... I mean, we, are, we have great activists here as senators. I, agree, I mean, that is the truth. Activism is not when you just buy one Android phone and begin to abuse everybody every day. That's not activism. Or activism is not when you begin to burn down vehicles and, and march. On. That's not activism. Activism is how to bring... You, are, say you, are, you say you are an activist and you are burning the cars of innocent people on the road. How are you bringing succor to them? Are those cars belonging to the president that you want to quarrel against? That's 
Stupidity. Apologize. The greatest activists are those in governance. And the greatest activists are people in the legislature. In governance. That is how. Mr. President, two more minutes. Two more minutes. And, and quickly as to my philosophy my philosophy of life I want to put it very simple in simple language I don't want to die without making a loud statement for society and for the poor and the downtrodden I don't want to die and that is why I have been, I have been, I have been restless since I was called to the bar and I'm sure you know that I eventually grew up in front of the nation Everybody saw me since I was in my, my 20s. I'm almost 50 now. But every single year, I have been restless in fighting for one thing or the other. And everybody watched me grow. The man standing out here, standing here, is that restless young lawyer you used to do many years ago that has grown to become a senior advocate of Nigeria standing here before you. So I grew up before your eyes, virtually. And so I have been restless because I don't want to die without making a loud statement. Time up, Mr. President. Mr. President. And for the, <laughs> Thank you very much. Distinguished Senator Manager, please. Distinguished Senator Manager. Which question hasn't he answered? No, you answer. Yeah. Two minutes, yes. Thank you very much. I, 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 was, I was brimming to answer that question, actually, because I didn't want to leave here without answering that question. On the Code of Conduct and its provisions, and, you know, vis-a-vis, the powers, the so-called powers, like you put it, of the presidential panel on recovery of proper property. There's a problem. The problem is that you allow the law to remain in your books. That law was passed in 1984. The law regarding recovery of public property. It was a decree. And when we now, i finish. I'll tie it in. And when we now transited to civil rule, they said all those laws that become acts of parliament. And so that law says the president has powers to set up any panel to recover public property. Let me tell you the difference. Let me tell you the difference. The code of conduct is a constitution. Is a constitution did not, no, hold on, sir, with respect, sir, did not criminalize, did not criminalize those provisions regarding the code of conduct. It is that act that now makes it criminal offense. That's the difference. So it's not in conflict. The code of conduct, they will only ban you from public office, ban you from, they will not send you to jail. But that act now makes it a criminal offense. So, I am also the lead prosecutor to the panel at some point. I'm the lead prosecutor. And then the Court of Appeal has actually curtailed the powers now. There's a judgment that the Court of Appeal says you cannot charge anybody to court. You can only investigate. And pass your investigation over to the Attorney General for the Attorney General to make a choice. So there's a Court of Appeal judgment. Anything beyond that is abuse of power. Anything beyond that is abuse of power. Is it? Is it? The distinguished, distinguished colleagues, please. I let's did that case. My case at the court of appeal. I did that case. Mr. Nomini, yes, I think you have answered enough uh, on that. The distinguished Senator James Eboy, manager. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> President. One lawyer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, seated as uh, chair. Uh, the Deputy Senior President, my highly respected colleagues, James Manager Delta South. Yes, Mr. President, you can see how excited I am. Yes. You have a good product. Really? Of course, I am. <laughs> For obvious reasons. Good product. And you know the reasons why. And see, you see me bouncing. Yes. Because that is what Delta is all about. <laughs> 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 Mr. President, the irrepressible Festus Kayam, <laughs> Lenin Sikh, has <laughs> said it all. And he has given good account of his personality, of what he stands for, and of course of, for what he represents. Mr. President, my highly respected colleagues, the Delta Caucus of course led by the able Deputy Senate President. He has mandated me to speak 
on behalf of the caucus. The Deputy Senior President, O.V. Omangigi, Distinguished Senator. The Senator representing Delta North, another lawyer. <laughs> All the three senators from Delta State are lawyers and also very senior at the bar. <laughs> Mr. President, we have come to the agreement and we speak for the entire Delta State. And between yesterday and today, we have consulted very widely. And the entire Delta State is behind this nominee. Mr. President, my highly respected colleagues, he has told us about who he is. He has used the instrumentality of the law to fight for social justice. He has used the jurisprudence of the law to ask questions about the law as it is and the law as it ought to be. Mr. President, he has said it all. And of course, Mr. President, First Kiamu is from Delta State, a proud constituent of the Deputy Senate President. And of course, this is very significant. Delta and Ogun, forget my mother. Delta and Ogun State. <laughs> Mr. President, my highly respected colleagues, to avoid wasting your time, because it's like the entire Senate is together, that this, senator must take, this nominee must take his bow and go. He, the Deputy Senate President represents him, and that is very significant, my respect. <laughs> so, Mr. President, I hereby say that let the Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and when, after listening to him, it is very obvious that we need to separate the office of the Attorney General from the office of the Honorable the Minister of Justice. Yes. Mr. President, I move that let the nominee take his bow and go. Thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, uh, the Sungush colleagues. I can 